Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Master Coaches Wednesday Weekly Buzz. I'm Bob Bertucci, joined by fellow Master Coaches Mick Haley, Tom Hilbert, and Jim Stone. We have a very exciting episode lined up for you today. But before we dive into the interview with the brilliant Gordon Mayforth, uh, I want to first just let everybody, just remind everybody that uh, tonight, the Pro Volleyball Federation will launch their inaugural season with their first match in Omaha, Nebraska. And that's going to be the Omaha Supernovas versus the Atlanta Vibe at the Chai Health Center at 8 p.m. this evening. So without any further ado, let's welcome our special guest for today, Gordon Mayforth. Hey, Bob. Uh, thanks to you, Jim, Tom, and Mick for uh, having me on, and uh, happy to be here. Uh, great to have you, Gordon. Uh, you know, uh, first, I, I just have to tell the, the audience our, our topic today is comparing collegiate coaching with pro coaching and that's kind of wide open and and gordon I, I think if i remember correctly the first time we really got to meet each other was when i was recruiting for tennessee years ago and you were just starting out with sports performance volleyball club up in chicago illinois mm -hmm. and yeah. you know with the recruiting stuff you you got to to learn a lot about the the collegiate game uh and be and be became very familiar with it, the game at that point. How about telling the audience where you went from there and how you got into pro volleyball? Because you've been at maybe 10 different pro teams over your career already. Um, yeah, again, thanks for having me here. Um, I was at Elmhurst and Western Michigan for the women, so I have uh, some experience on that side in uh, the women's collegiate game. And then I started the Loyola men's team and was part of the coaching staff that won the gold medal at the World University Games in 2001 and met some contacts and since then have coached in seven different leagues overseas. Um, as you said, maybe it could be up to 10 now. Uh, 10 different pro teams and uh, two national teams in the last 20 years. So pretty much the last 20 years overseas. So you're in a very unique position to, to kind of give us that comparison between collegiate coaching and, and pro coaching. So let's jump right into it. Uh, Mick, why don't you take it away with the first question? Bob, you caught me off guard here. <laughs> just, Gordon, just tell us, start this off like we want to know yeah. what your approach is would be that's different than college approach now um, and I've seen a couple of the teams practice so I know how they're practicing I don't know how your team's practicing so we'd we'd like to know right away just your impressions uh, and what you do differently um, first of all if you've seen a few of the other teams practicing if you could send me some notes after the show that'd be great um, yeah, so first of all, I'd like to send a quick shout out to our head coach, uh, Amy Pauly. Um, I want to tell everybody out there that she is an extremely bright and great volleyball coach. Uh, she's a really good with communication, uh, extremely articulate and very well organized. Um, so I'm having fun working with her on this staff. You know, the biggest difference is in college there's some skill development especially with some of your players coming in um, and you get to some good situational stuff at the higher levels um, of course we're still working on some skill stuff with them but quite often that part of their craft or their skill or their development is pretty well complete and so we're working on more situational stuff um, so that's kind of the difference in the practices uh, maybe in college i spent a little bit more time on skill and on the pro side, we're kind of picking out specific situational stuff that we just want to get better at. That's interesting. Now, Gordon, I'd like to ask you this, because in the collegiate game, you know, we look at things long term. Uh, a season's a long time. You got four weeks of non-conference. 
but do you look at things as, Hey, we, you know, we have to do things immediately for the next game up or are you taking a long-term uh, approach to, to coaching the team? Yes. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, long-term in Europe, uh, when I was coaching in Europe, that's about three weeks. Um, and if you lose to your cross town rival, you probably didn't even make the three weeks. So, um, it's a pretty results driven, um, environment, especially in Europe, um, in Asia, uh, both my experiences over there, you know, the nine years in Japan and the three years in Indonesia, it's a little bit more long-term, but, uh, for sure, very results driven. Hey, hey, Gordon, you know, you know kind of the, my original thought with this question was how do you blend in players that are coming from a variety of backgrounds, sometimes a variety of nationalities into one, uh, you know, somewhat cohesive unit. But, you know, kind of with the way players are moving around collegiately with the NIL, you know, maybe some college coaches might so find some relevance to, you know, bringing players from a variety of backgrounds, a variety of philosophies, how much time do you spend trying to, you know, wrap your team into kind of one, one general thought pattern? Here's how we're going to kind of approach the game. Or do you just take whatever they come, come in with and try to do the best you can to cobble together a, a cohesive unit? So my experience is, Jim, that's a great question. Um, a couple of facets of that. Uh, the first one is the biggest difference in professional is this is the first time in the player's life that they're going to be on a team where everybody is not basically the same age and relatively the same development, uh, meaning through high school, through college, through club, uh, even if they did some USA stuff and they played on some junior teams, they've all been basically the same. You know, like on our team right now, we have some rookies that just came out of college and we have a player who's 42 years old. And this is not new uh, for me, but it is for them. And so you have this really wide age range. You also have cultural differences. You're going to have people from different countries. And my experience, as well as talking to other uh, coaches in professional sports, other professional sports, um, culture is a big deal. And so... If I could surmise all of that, I would say um, at the professional level, I think the head coach has to be really good at three things. Number one, adding value to every single player. And that's not easy when you have a 42-year-old who's been playing for 30 years. Um, and number two, you got to be really specific with the roles and the goals. What is everybody's role and what is the team goals and what is everybody's individual goal? And then number three, holding accountability. And after that, you kind of hire staff to fill in whatever else you need. But if you're doing those three things, I think your longevity as a professional coach is uh, pretty good. I so might let's, 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 go, let's go to you for a second. I, I think, you know, you wanted to ask uh, Gordon a little bit about the assistant position he just mentioned. Was that, would you direct that to me, Bob? I'm sorry. Yes, Tom. Yeah. Um, th that, that's basically a simple question. What, how, what did the role of the assistant coach in the professional level versus what it was like at the college level? Yeah. So there it really depends on, um, you know, what that definition is by the head coach. It could be pretty ranging. Um, it might be somebody who specializes in practice. It might be somebody who specializes in scouting. Um, it could be very wide ranging. Um, it's interesting to me, if you go back and look at all of this, uh, on our team, everybody, you know, I kind of go by G. And uh, on this team, maybe I go by OG. Um, but compared to the other assistants in this league, I'm young. So, you know, we got Bill Walton and we got Brian and we got Dietra and we got Denise. And um, you can't forget about, you know, the great one Cardona with Columbus. So it's interesting that all of these coaches uh, brought in some older people uh, to kind of be there. And I, and I think that's important because you're dealing with athletes who 
didn't just start playing the game. They've been playing the game a long time. And many of them played for a lot of great coaches. You know, they played for Mick or they played for Jim or they played for Tom or they played for Bob. And they know what good volleyball is. They know what good training is. And so um, I think it's a level where you want to have people who can uh, operate with the professional athletes. Are you still using a lot of uh, like data and how is that collected? Is there a, is there a, a collective like data volley or um, sorry, volley metrics working with you? Um, so we use volley station in the matches, but volley metrics is, so we have partnerships with both of them. Uh, the league did an outstanding job of getting partnerships with both volley metrics and volley station. Uh, volley station is kind of a twin of data volley. So however you want to look at that. Um, we use video and data and playback video in practice without question. Uh, when I'm teaching for the FIVB, I, one of the questions on the level two test, literally on the level two test, I'm giving away a question here is who's the best coach in the gym, a Bob Bartucci, B Mick Haley, C Jim Stone or D the playback video. And if they choose any of the first three, they're wrong. The professional athlete likes watching themselves play, and um, you got to have playback video in the gym. You did not include me in that. <laughs> because that would have given them a problem passing the test, Tom, because they automatically would have chosen you, and I don't want them to fail the test. We want those people to get those licenses and to go on coaching around the world and make volleyball a better place. Tom, you're just too young to be included in that group. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, Mick, you had, uh, you know, some practice management uh, questions uh, for Gordon. Bob, I have two questions. Uh, I'll try to get them out before the noise comes back. <laughs> I need your attention. <laughs> no. The first one is when I was national team coach, uh, my players were being approached by uh, by uh, agents and other other coaches overseas to leave the team and go play for those people. I didn't handle that very well, and I wonder if, if that's a situation that you guys are going to have to deal with or maybe have dealt with. And then secondly, um, is there a fear from the American players that uh, that they might get cut in a week or two or a month. Uh, how does that work with uh, with the players in the new league? Yeah, great questions, Mick. Um, so I'll take the first one first. Um, when I started this, and it was probably around the same time Mick was coaching the national team. So um, in 2002, most of the signings were happening um, in that April, May range. You know, today, um, this year, there are players already playing on teams who are signing contracts for next season, uh, not on the same team, different team. Um, and this is this year, it's really early because Japan is expanding their league with the number of teams, and they're finally going to go to three foreign players, two from anywhere in the world and one from Asia. So that's really opened the door to some high salaries over there. And so there are team, there are players already in the process of signing contracts for next season who are currently playing for a team. We don't have that going on right now with our team that I know of. Um, could be true. Um, but I've kind of learned that that's kind of part of the business now. This is just kind of the way it goes. And um, yeah, so that one is just kind of I've gotten used to over the years that that's just kind of part of the business. Um, on the cutting side regarding the PVF, you know, um, almost all of us, except for San Diego and Las Vegas, are already down to our uh, 14, our rostered players and our two practice players. So we have had to waive some players. Um, a couple of waived players have been picked up by other teams. But certainly, I don't know about other franchises, but when we're waving players, uh, Amy and I are immediately jumping on with agents all over the world, and we are trying to help them find a place to play. Because the goal is not to bring players in and spit them out. The goal is to have a great league in this, in this country and develop players and hopefully make it someplace that everybody wants to play 
And uh, if they can't play here, we certainly want them out playing volleyball somewhere. Hey, uh, Gordon, kind of a, I guess a multi-prone question. And you already alluded a little bit to the idea, <clears throat> pardon me, that you don't spend a preponderance of time uh, in skill work with players. Um, you know, you have Ari Cruz is 40 plus years old and, you know, she's going to be, she's going to play how she's going to play. Um, some younger players, however, might, you know, might have a different approach to things. Um, but I guess the direction I'm, that I'm heading is, um, did, did that kind of thought pattern enter into how you drafted players? Like, we're going to draft players that already have this skill set inside of this position, or was it from a perspective of we're going to draft this player and then we'll, we'll teach them how to play the position, Does that, if that makes sense, you know? So, um, you know, kind of how did you blend the, the um, you know, not, not de-emphasizing skill development, but just uh, putting it in a, a place uh, that might be behind other factors that you're considering, and did that impact how you drafted players? Um, yeah, so I'm going to circle back around and pick up a question that I might have blew by. Um, and then I'm going to go back and get on. Actually, let me start with Jim's. Um, it dramatically affected what we were doing with, uh, I, don't, I can't speak for the other teams, but basically um, our staff, again, Amy being extremely organized, we gamed out every scenario of the draft um, possible. And I mean, we, we had maybe six or seven very long meetings where we had boards all over the room and we had data and we had everything and we really took it down. And in the end, uh, if you look at our draft, we are keeping all five of our draftees. We haven't waived or cut any of them. Uh, we felt really good that the draft went with one exception, the exact way we thought it was going to go. And on draft day, while other teams, it would be like so-and-so's on the clock, and it would start at five minutes. So-and-so has two minutes left. So-and-so has 30 seconds left. It became a joke that you know, finally, Jen uh, Spiker, the CEO, said, don't even start the clock for Orlando, because as soon as our turn came up, we were holding up the piece of paper. We knew what we were going to do. Um, so, but answering Jim's question directly, three of our players that we drafted um, were very specific to our needs, and they're on our 14-man roster. Two of our players, uh, we kind of wanted to take a long-term vision. Uh, again, this goes to Amy's direction and where Amy wanted to take the program long-term. And so we took two players that maybe were not in their real position that we thought they could play. And we're now moving them into positions that Amy and the staff feel like, hey, a year or two from now, this player is going to be great in this position and we're willing to put in the time and money. Fair enough. Go on, those are great insights. Uh, let's move to some more team dynamic uh, type questions. All right. And Tom, why don't we go ahead and, and start okay. with you, your question? Yeah. It's, and it's simply, you know, we get very concerned with 17 to 21 year olds about mm -hmm. team chemistry. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wonder how you work with that at the pro level. Yeah, so team culture is extremely important. I don't think you can talk to any professional coach in any pro sport anywhere in the world and have them not mention team culture. Um, it's a big deal. And so we spend a lot of time on team culture. But my experience is the great um, college coaches, uh, again, all four of you, um, you had a recruiting system and then you had a scouting system and you had an offensive system and you had a defensive system. And we have some irritation with some of our younger players that haven't played a lot around the world right now. They're asking me, uh, cause I'm kind of running our block in defense and they say, well, what's our base system? And I said, who are we playing? Who's the hitter? What's going on on the other side? Um, you know, so my experience is the professional level, um, even national teams to an extent, although sometimes national teams are a little bit more systemized, 
Um, the professional level is just driven by personnel uh, on a constant basis. Uh, what, what do we need to improve? This is our personnel and what do we need to improve our weaknesses? This is our personnel and how can we stop the other side? Um, it's very personnel driven on a, on a very daily basis. Um, and circling back to a question I think I glossed over, which is just kind of about, you know, in regards to practice, which is load management or whatever. In college, uh, we just, you know, we did a lot of skill training and we did some weight training. Um, the professional athlete, their body is how they make money. Their body is how I make money. <laughs> if their body cannot function, they and I both lose money. Um, because we'll both get fired. So um, they want to spend a lot more time on their rehab and their conditioning. And the only way I can really make this real for everybody is when Mike Krzyzewski, he tells the story way better than I do, so look it up on YouTube. But when he got the first call to go to the national team, he sent out the schedule. And right away, I mean, within seconds of the schedule being sent, LeBron James is blowing up his phone and says, hey, coach, I'm so excited to play for you. But I see we're doing double days. You know, I'm kind of used to going and getting my rehab with my personal trainer, and then I go and get my massage, and then I go and get – and he's like, okay, 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 I get that. And, like, literally he hangs up the phone as he tells the story, and Kobe blows him up. While he's on the phone with Kobe, he's getting blown up by another one, another one, another one, and another one. He quickly sends out another schedule and says, we'll be doing one practice a day. <laughs> you know, because to them, they're, they understand that they make big money with their physical abilities. And they want to make sure that is ready to go at all times. They don't ever want to put a bad product on the floor. And that's my experience globally. Anywhere I've ever been, the athlete wants to be fresh and ready for game day. They want to be ready to go. And do you feel like they know and that everyone around them trusts, hey, this is what my body can do and this is the limits? Um, some of them think they know, <laughs> and that requires some education. And you have to move that meter slowly. If I learned very quickly not to take an aggressive stance on that. Um, it doesn't go well. Um, some of them really do know, you know, and – I got to tell you, you know, I came back uh, from Japan a few years ago and then I was wondering, do I want to go coach college? Okay. Um, I knew I kind of wanted to stay in the U.S. Um, I took a look at the IMG thing. And when you're in the gym, as Mick can tell you, with the professional athlete or a national team athlete, it's just fun. Um, they do things on a daily basis. They think about the game. They move around on the court. You don't have to teach it. It's just fun to watch them play. It, I mean, it's constant, even in our own gym right now, that I just kind of sit back sometimes and be like, that was a great block, Kaz. Yeah, that's exactly the way we wanted to do it. I mean, they just do stuff that makes you enjoy being in that atmosphere. And I completely understand after 20 years of it why – you know, um, some of these older coaches who retire and step away come back. And I'm expecting Mick to be back soon because there is nothing, and I mean nothing, that can simulate playing for a professional championship in front of a packed house on live national television. There's nothing like that in the world. And to get that, there's only one way to get that. You got to get back on the floor. You got to get, you got to get good, and you got to get yourself back in that situation. So, Mick, go ahead. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna point out something that Jim Stone's really good at. Uh, in his uh, weekly musings, he comes out with all kinds of different comparisons with different sports. The one that I compare. Uh, or pay attention to mostly is the uh, Los Angeles Dodgers, how they take older players, work on their techniques, refine them, or in some place, some cases actually change either their, their swing or their pitching motion or those kinds of things. Why can't we do that in volleyball? Or are we? Uh, I got from the discussion 
that we're mostly kind of letting the players come in and do their thing. And of course, if they're really good at it, nobody's going to mess with them. But some want to be as good as like Samantha Bricio. Every time she goes with a team, either in China or Europe, they finish first or second or in Turkey. Uh, whatever team picks her up, they're first or second. Okay, so there's something going on there that she she does well. Um, but what about volleyball? I think that question is to you, right, Jim? <laughs> I'll, pa I'll pass. You're you're the one getting the big bucks right now. <laughs> oh boy, if you think what I'm making is big bucks, um, I, I missed that Japan paycheck. Um, uh, yeah, so. Mick, I do think we do it. And the hard part is in Europe, there's the coaches are really under a lot of stress to win right away, right now. And so they don't want to take the time. And that's a kind of a cultural model that's not good. Um, I really don't think that's good for volleyball. In Asia, we do take the time. I mean, in Japan, our our our, month, our season is about eight months, but then we have some preseason and we have some other cups going on. So it really lasts about 10 months. And we talk a lot about how to improve that athlete or change something over time, even if it's that older athlete. Again, I go back to the most important thing for the coach is, can I add value to that high level athlete and how to add value to that high level athlete? Because if I add value to that high, or we add value to that high level athlete, they will buy into what we are doing. So um, I do think it's important, but too many of the leagues are in this, you must win now mode. Um, and I wish it wasn't that. And this league is just such a short window, you know, being four and a half months, um, I don't want to speak for Amy, but I think there's players that we have waived that we might have kept if we were in an eight month season. Well, Gordon, kind of uh, dovetailing on the mixed question, um, you know, anytime you're going to make a change, you know, it takes, especially in the middle of the season, that's hard to do because you're always getting ready for the next match. Um, will, will the players stick around uh, Orlando? and okay this is my time where i can really get better or is it four months and i'm gone off to my next adventure and i guess part part two of that is do you do you anticipate this is kind of a roster management question do you anticipate as these leagues wrap up from around the world players coming back and joining orlando if if available and if there's a mutual interest and that type of thing. So I, if you could address those two things, you know, kind of uh, do you, are, will your players be sticking around and um, do you foresee roster management uh, dilemmas as other players become available? Maybe and definitely. <laughs> You're not getting paid by the word here. I mean, <laughs> I'm getting paid. <laughs> Should've done some more research. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, so definitely <coughs> um, taking your second question first. Without question, the China situation is interesting because China is about the only league that ends early enough to really impact us. Possibly Korea, and uh, which Koba? I might be saying her name wrong. And uh, Lazar Lazaravia. Lazareva from Russia are two players in our league that are playing in China, uh, one for Omaha and one for Atlanta. So there's definitely two that are coming. Um, and I'm sure the rest of us are looking at that league as they begin to wrap up. Um, Willow is also interesting in that she just went back to Korea because of a contractual thing. And so I don't know how that's going to go. So that could be another one that could wrap up. In short, our league doesn't pair real well with anything else. This is the one thing that the coaches have been talking a lot about to the management. I love the way the PF, PBF is structured. I love um, the structure of the PBF. I like the management. The one thing that it doesn't do is it doesn't pair well with anything. You can't play in Puerto Rico and then play for us. It's the same time. You can't play in Europe and play for us. It's the same time. 
You can't play in Japan and play for us at the same time. You can play in China, but you're going to come back. I mean, the Chinese, I think the last day they're all done, you know, because they do the play out system. So they go all the way down. And so it's not like you're done early. Um, I think they're mid-February. So if you're okay having players come in mid-February who just went through playing a schedule where they're playing almost three matches a week, um, yeah, I mean, I think we're all going to be looking at it. But it's not a given. Um, the load's heavy in China, and they play a lot of matches in a short period of time. Um, and I wish our league would pair better with somebody else because that goes back to your first question, Jim, which is what do they do after this? And how do they stay ready for this? You know, we, we start basically at the beginning of January with one mini camp in the fall. And right now that's what the league rules are. And we finish, you know, by mid May. And um, what do they do the rest of the time? This is a grand question. If you're on a national team, it's an easy answer. You got the national team calendar. If you're not on a national team, which right now many of our players are not, uh, just meaning not just Valkyries, but everybody in the league, many of them are not on a national team. So where do they go? What do they do? I think I would throw the ball back to you guys. Can you play volleyball at a high level, Mick or Tom or Jim or Bob, if you're only training four and a half months a year? Well, I think that was the, I, I thought what Jim was asking was more like coming from a college situation where, you know, you play your season in the fall and then you stay in town and you're at school, of course, and you're training. All right. And you have a little bit of a spring season. And now, of course, you're training through the summer and now you're back to your team. Jim, is that kind of what you were thinking when you asked that question? Are they going to stay in town? Yeah, it, 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 it kind of started with the whole skill development um, process with the idea of it's hard to really, you know, focus a lot of a coach's attention on skill development in the middle of the season. So it's more of an off season, more time, go slower, that type of thing. But the players have to be available. You have to have a gym available and, and all those things. So um, and, and maybe it's too soon to tell you know, what the, what the future holds, but as a coach, would you like to have, you know, players stick around and, Hey, let's work on this part of your game as opposed to everybody, you know, scurrying off to their, their next thing. Now national team, you understand, but that second layer, um, they, you know, who, who knows their availability. So hopefully that, you know, you understand the direction I'm heading with my question. Yep. Um, currently, and um, I, I think you guys have Shelton coming on after this, and so he's a great person to address it to as well. But currently, our league does not allow us to have contact with the players outside of our um, training camp season, our season, and then our mini camp. And it, the mini camp is only allowed to be three days. All of the head coaches, I think, are with you, Jim, that we need more time with the athlete, whether that's more mini camps or more training camps or something. Um, but we've got to have a window where we're able to train the player. I just don't think that the player can be at a high level playing volleyball if they don't touch the ball more than four and a half months a year. It's a, it's a hard thing to do. Tom, do you, you have some questions yeah. about, you know, the draft and the yeah, college yeah. players? You might want, want right. and, and that was, you know, I don't know how much time we have left, but you guys did a draft for the first time. Um, it's an interesting concept. I don't know how many foreign leagues even have drafts or whether they just sign players. But um, what were the different approaches you witnessed? Because there's a lot of former college coaches coaching these pro teams. Um, how did they – manage the draft and just speak, speak to those different approaches they took. Yeah. Um, great question for Shelton. Ask him that one. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think each uh, staff had their own strategy during the draft and Tom, you're absolutely right. Um, in Puerto Rico, they have a draft kind of a quasi draft uh, when I coached there and I'm trying to think in Cyprus, we had a draft. 
Um, but not many places in the world have a draft. It's basically what Tom said. You pick your players, and most places in the world, they don't tell you how much you can practice. And if you want to start earlier, you can start earlier, and you just got to pay them more, or you got to get them there, or whatever. You got to make an agreement with the professional athlete that they're willing to do it. Um, so this league is more in the American system, where we have some really set rules about how much we can work with the athlete. Vic, why don't you uh, finish up with a, a last question for Gordon? Because I know he's busy. We we promised we'd keep him to forty minutes. So, okay. So I I have just a quick question, but I have heard, and this is not I, not from a, a source that's uh, uh, that I can count on, but I, I have heard that the Atlanta franchise is actually going to be in a moving into a facility that has all kinds of different. Uh, weight rooms, uh, uh, kinds of training that you could do, technical work, um, uh, all of that. Are all the other teams moving in that direction, or is Atlanta not moving in that direction? That's just a rumor. Yeah, as usual, Mick usually has better sources than I do. That's no big <laughs> surprise. Uh, he always is better plugged in than everybody else. Um, it could be true. I mean, I absolutely would love to be in a permanent facility um most of except for one professional situation that i was in um we were in that type of situation and then as mick says you really tailor the facility to what you know the culture and the team needs are and um, that would be outstanding now some of this is money and logistical um you know our owner owns a uh online pet food company so if everybody goes out and buys a lot of uh, pet food i guess we get our own facility next year so everybody go get a dog go get a dog go get a dog right now um and buy lots of pet food um but um you know i just in closing because i know shelton's on and he's uh you should be talking to the head coach there so um i want to thank you guys for having us on um we are so excited and I am so excited personally to have a professional league here in the United States. Um, I'm fired up to watch uh, Shelton and uh, Todd's team go at it tonight. I think you're going to see some amazing volleyball right out of the gate. Um, this league, I think, is going to start at a high level. And I think we're going to continue to move forward. So I am extremely fired up on uh, being able to coach in my own home country. And Go Valkyries on. is the coolest name in the it's, league. And oh, I think people should look up what it is because it, I think it's a great, cool name. It, it certainly is. And, and again, a uh, shout out. Uh, that was kind of Steven, but also a shout out again to Amy. She had a lot of input on the logo and, um, uh, Kind of the whole color scheme and uh we we really like it we are very happy well gordon great you know fantastic insights great to have you on thanks very much for for taking the time out of your busy schedule and i'm sure we'll have you back again okay and uh mick you're going to send me those notes from those other teams right <laughs> <laughs> all right guys thanks so much all right gordon bye-bye well, as, as Gordon had mentioned, as we transition into our, what's usually our buzz reaction, uh, we have a special guest joining us today, a, a longtime friend and head coach for Omaha Supernovas. All right, let's welcome Shelton Collier. Hello, guys. Hey, Shelton, it's good to see you. Good to be with you guys. Well, we know you're pretty busy today, so we're glad you're able to take a few minutes out of your day. And uh, as I've heard, you, you've been doing quite a few uh, interviews there out in Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah, my first bone with Hilbert there, um, the Supernovas is the coolest name in the league, <laughs> not the other one. And um, Jason Derulo has, you know, a couple hundred million followers that say the Supernovas is the best name. So there you go. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what, moving to Omaha, people talk about Nebraska volleyball. I have never in my life done the type of interviewing and been on radio shows and TV shows and talk shows and 
the amount of media that comes to our practice on media day, there's literally 10, 12, 15 cameras. They interview every player post practice. We have press conferences, just like a big time sport here, post practice. It's, uh, it's exciting slash overwhelming, but today we get to talk about volleyball tonight. And, uh, there is a lot to these, this job uh, in this professional league with so many people are interested in it outside of volleyball that um, tonight we get to play a big match and, and we've been working really hard to get ready for that. And uh, I, I just appreciate you guys and what you do for volleyball and what you've done for our league. I think you guys have done a lot for the Pro Volleyball Federation. I think you do a lot to educate the community. I, I know you guys are all highly respected and you've had different people in and off the show. and. And quite frankly, I got a lot to do today, but it's out of respect for you guys and the, and, and the influence you have on volleyball that I said, you know, I got some time today. I'm getting ready for a, the biggest match I've ever coached in in my life. <laughs> but you guys are important and the show's important and getting volleyball knowledge out to fans is important. So, you know, I'll take some time with you guys and see where it goes. All right. Well, why don't we start? Uh you know, with, with Mick Haley asking uh, Shelton uh, the first question, of course, I, I know he's eager to do that. Well, <clears throat> Shell, if you've been listening. Um, actually, we, I have not. I was I was actually working on a little game plan here for a little bit. Okay. And then okay. I tuned in and exactly, I heard Gordon, uh, maybe his last uh, question there, but I did not hear the whole show. I'll catch the replay. Well, one of the questions we asked before uh, with Gordon, that was interesting is how <clears throat> how are you approaching your team? Are you trying to teach anything, skills or whatever? Are you or, or are you just in the process of systems and getting people on in the best spots? Yeah, I think it's it's an interesting thing because it's a it's a sprint and a marathon at the same time. I mean, we're in a sprint to get ready for what could be one of the most epic volleyball matches in the history of our country with a professional match on TV with so much interest. We have to get ready for this one, but also we have a whole season. So I think we're trying to do both. We're trying to get ready for this match tonight, but we're also playing a long game that we have an entire season. And when you talk about learning, I'll give you a great example. I went up to Betty De La Cruz in a practice and I said, Betty, can I help you with something? And she says, everybody wants to learn. I said, but if I do something a little bit different with you that you normally do, is that okay with you? And she goes, of course, I want to get better. And Betty De La Cruz helps our younger players and teaches them and pulls them aside in drills and rallies and, and helps them. And Tori Dixon will take Danielle Hart aside and talk to her about middle blocking. And she's changing some things because of the influence of the veterans or our coaches. And they're receptive to learning because they want to get better, but also we're conscientious that we can't change too many things right now and have them their head spinning on the first match. So we have changed some things and we have made some technical improvements, but also we're trying to feature what they do best and, and maximize that as well. So we're just trying to be smart coaches and, and figure it out as we go. Shelton, you mentioned that you're on TV tonight. Uh, what station are you on tonight? Yeah, I, I wish I could help you guys more with that. I know it's a stadium broadcast, which is free to the public. Uh, I, I don't know all the mechanics of it, but I believe you can get it if you have YouTube TV or a sports app. If you go to stadium, I'll send this to you when I'm off there. I think you can click a link and go directly to stadium and watch it live for free. Um, so anybody in the world can do it. I imagine there'll be a pretty international and worldwide and and uh united states viewing of this as well as local and it's on nebraska tv where um the nebraska tv network is putting it on as well for nebraska tv um i, I don't know all the mechanics of that i'm trying to figure out how we're going to side out in rotation four a little more efficiently right now so um but i know it's going to be on tv yeah I, right. I i read today it's on news nebraska but you can get it on roku if you have Roku and you can get it on Amazon, uh, if you have that streaming service too. Well, I guess that's part of the learning curve. Uh, Tom, do you have a question for Shelton about our, our topic today? Well, um, I act, my, my question is not going to mirror one from the other, um, from the other, from, from asking Gordon. But what I want to know is with you're in Omaha, 
with this unbelievable culture, a fan culture for volleyball. Is that something that you, when you were creating this team, were you thinking about, we've got to get some Husker players um, because we got to keep the, you know, the, a tie to from Husker volleyball into this pro team, or was that out the door? Well, I think certainly having local players of interest is important, but also, you know, our job is to have the best team possible. So I don't think we wanted to compromise a roster spot just to have a Nebraska player. But at the same time, a lot of the sweet spot Nebraska players, you know, Matty Kubik or some of the prominent Nebraska players are already contracted overseas. So, you know, we did talk with Jordan Larson and I had many, many conversations with Jordan about the possibilities and she was considering it. She decided to stay training in Anaheim and try to do what's best for her body and get ready for Paris. And I have total respect for that. But she had a serious conversations with us about maybe coming and being a supernova. So we did that. We have Gina mancuso Prasovsky, who was a former Husker, great player there. <clears throat> We've got some big 10 players that all these Nebraska fans love. They love Sidney Hilly. They love Danielle Hart. They love Kendall White. They love Nia Reed. They love Brooke Nunaviller. So these fans have quick, we have had lines out the door for autograph sessions with loving these players that are here. So I think the, the Nebraska fans have simply said, this is our team. Now we're going to embrace them and let's go. All right, Jim, I know you're a longtime friend of Shelton's. I'm sure you have a couple of questions for him. Well, I, I was just curious, you know, as you were putting this thing together, Shelton, um, in terms of, okay, I got the job, kind of, okay, now what? Um, it sounded like the, 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 the process of seeing who's available, who's not available, who's interested, um, it sounded like college recruiting on steroids. I mean, it just, I mean, how many phone calls were you making a day? And, you know, I think that the genesis of this whole thing was the difference between college and professional coaching um, but did you find a lot of difference between college and the recruiting you were doing as you were putting your, your team together? Yeah, it, it was a free for all for every player in the country and every player in the world was a free agent. So, um, in college, at least, you know, there's a senior high school class that's coming out. Well, I guess now in college, you can recruit everybody in the country off of everybody else's team. I guess that's what's happening. True. But, but when we, we did, uh, we did a basically everybody in the country was deciding, am I going to go overseas to play? Am I going to stay here? They didn't know much about the league. There was skepticism about the league. We got some core players right away that kind of built some confidence. You know, uh, Atlanta got some core players. Grand Rapids got some core players. And pretty soon people said, hey, this league is going to have good players. And then other players joined in. But very much like college recruiting, it was winning a player over with some trust or winning them over with that we have this to offer. Omaha does is in a unique position. We have some really, really good bells and whistles here that our ownership has put together. So it's kind of like the arms race in college where people want to go where there's places where there's a lot of support for athletes. We have a lot of that in place here. So a lot of players were attracted to that. They also know they're going to be playing in front of the, the largest crowds, you know, in the league, that's kind of a, assumed. And so people want to come where they're going to, play in front of large crowds with sponsor opportunities. So that's happening. So when that happened, it basically was a free for all. Uh, 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 and even in the draft, a, a, a draft player would literally get seven phone calls from the PVF the week they're playing for their regional championship and their coach didn't want them talking to anybody. And they got seven coaches from seven phone calls saying, Hey, will you come to my team? If I draft you, this has been kind of a free for all, but, that's the nature of the business. And next year, what's going to happen, teams are going to have more international players. It's going to be a free for all of everybody calling their agents, calling international players, come to my team, come to my team. We can give you this. We can give you that. And, you know, there's some, going to be some of the best international players in the world that are going to be playing in the PVF next year. But everybody is going to be having independent conversations with them and their agents as if they were a free agent. If there is a free agent in the NBA, Every team can talk to them and offer them whatever they want and can have under the table deals and work and do all this stuff. That's what's going to happen when people are free agents is all the teams are going to try to get in with them through their agents or around the corner or with sponsors. All that is going to happen. And it's going to be 
I mean, it's a free for all and you got to try to win the free for all. It's going to be a real challenge for us. And as coaches, we have to do it while we're in season trying to win matches now and looking around the corner tomorrow and saying, I know, but we have to recruit some international player this week who's getting other offers while we're trying to win matches. You want to come help me, Jim? <laughs> That's way too much work. <laughs> And then how do you see the LOVB fitting into that whole process? Well, you know, when you're a good coach like you are, Tom, you know what you tell your players? You control the controllables. Right. You, pro you probably wrote that in a book and probably told that to your team in pregame. You know, I control the controllables. I have my team. We can do what our franchise does. We have our league. You know, we realize that there's another league and they're offering contracts to people. They're offering contracts to people in our league as we speak. They're offering contracts to my players who are playing volleyball tonight for us. So that's something that's happening. But right now, we're really focused on what we can do, how we can retain our players and offer them a great opportunity here. I mean, our players in Omaha are in luxury apartments. We have unbelievable medical staff, support staff. We've got all these things here. And we want our players to want to stay in, in, in Omaha. And we like other players to want to come play in Omaha. But we can't control what the other league is doing and they're building it in a different way. And they're also recruiting players and they're trying to sign players to contracts that are actively under contracts with us. So there's really nothing I can do about that. You know, I'd like to get to 25 points tonight in one game and and celebrate that and know, hey, we, we did that. Now let's try to go get the next game. And if people are making phone calls to my players trying to get them to sign with another league, that's something I can't do anything about. And it's a reality. But I also look back like the NFL and AFL and the NBA and ABA. That's what happened. There was this fight for players. And then eventually one of the leagues won out and overpowered the other league and took their best players and took their best cities. And 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 it happened. And I, and I would assume that if somebody was really smart, they would look into the future with a crystal ball and say, in X amount of years, there'll be two leagues. One league will overtake the other league due to whatever factors, the other league will join the other league and they'll merge just like the NFL, AFL, just like the NBA and the ABA did. I think that we're on track for that. But what that means is we have a meaningful league that's being patterned after the greatest sports in the world. And now volleyball, I think, is on that path. So if you're on the greatest path with the best sports, that's, what's, that's what the best sports do. It's like women's college volleyball. They don't want NIL and transfer portal. And yet, Men's football and men's basketball are the best sports in the world, and they do it. So if volleyball wants to be good, they just got to join the party and, and be what good sports do. And if you want legitimacy, that's what happens. So our leagues want to be legitimate, so they're probably going to fight with one another for a while. And then one league is going to take over the other league and be really good. But this is the time for women's pro volleyball right now. On the cusp of the attendance records and the Big Ten Network attendance, uh, on TV attendance, there's people that are wanting a pro volleyball league. But the thing is, we're first out of the gate. You know, we get our product out there tonight, tomorrow night for this whole season. I think fans are going to love our players, love the other. There's so many stars in this league that fans are going to love and they're going to watch them on TV. They're going to come to the games live. And I think our league is just going to explode with popularity. That's a great answer. That's one of the best and most frank answers I've heard to that question. Well, I know I get scrutinized by Haley if I don't really tell him what's behind the curtain. So I thought we'd just go there. <laughs> just, just go there right away, Shelton. Don't waste any time. I know the drill on this show. Hey, hey Sheldon, if you could have a pick of the any player in the world, <clears throat> what position would you pick? What position? You know, you've got you've got liberos, you've got middle blockers, you've got setters, you've got outside hitters. If you could pick first, and you get the pick of the whole world, what would you pick? What position would you pick? What's the most important position in the I pro think it sport? Could be a, it could be a tie between the best passing outside hitter that can terminate, or the best opposite that can terminate under every circumstance, front row, back row. And the reason I say that is if there was a left side that is a gifted passer that can terminate at that clip, that that's two jobs and that's great. But 
I don't know that there's anything more valuable than an opposite that you can just set in six rotations and and finish the ball at a high level. I think those would be the two you would you would want to have. And I think some other positions are plug and play, even at the highest level. But those two are not plug and play. Hey, so I have, I have a, a different question. Um, have you found um, with the younger players coming out of college, uh, has the uh, you know the fifteen subs, front row, back row stuff that goes on in college all the time? Do you find players that that has has impacted their value to the professional league because they've only played front row or they've only played back row and um, are the college rules impacting, you know, professional prospects? And do you see at some point, it, and if the answer is, you know, possibly yes, where the, where the high school kids are going to start going, you know, similar to, to college basketball, um, I want to go to a program that's going to prepare me for the pros rather than just uh, be a front row player for four years. Yeah. And Jim, I've read your blogs for years where you bang this drum and you you're a really smart guy and you you look ahead to this. I think I think in the clubs, people play to get a college volleyball scholarship and they can get a college volleyball scholarship, a full ride to go to the top team in the country playing three rotations and be a subbed out in the back row. They can get a full scholarship being a defensive specialist or a three rotation player because that's the highest goal they may have now. I think when they start looking at the pro league, they might say, I want more than a college although scholarship. I want to play for the Omaha Supernovas. I want to play for the Atlanta Vibe. I want to play for Orlando, San Diego. I want to go beyond uh, college volleyball. So then their aspiration as a 16 year old to say, I don't want to settle for being a 16, a six, uh, a three rotation player because my aspirations are beyond that. And you will have some national team players that will tell a college coach, I want to play six rotations to get ready for the national team. And a college coach will tell them whatever they want them to hear and then play them three rotations. And then they go to the national team and they only played them three rotations. And they said, Hey coach, I thought I was playing six rotations. That's when I was recruiting you. Now we have to win volleyball games. So that's real. But I do think in this league, there's going to be some sit, some three rotation outside hitters that are not going to be as desirable for our league. People are saying, are you crazy? Why don't you take her? Because she's one of the best hitters in the country, but she gets served off the court in the pro volleyball federation. So you're right. We would rather have a six rotation player that could hit a little bit less than her, but somebody that experienced six rotation player. And there's no way these players can come out of college playing three rotations and get exposed to getting served six rotations in the pro volleyball federation and be a successful player. They just can't, I mean, you can learn it, but to put them in first year and say, now you're going to get served six rotations and you've never done that in your life. I don't think any of us are going to gamble on that. We're going to take a more tried and true product. On the other hand, we have on our team right now a player that didn't pass in college and she's working every day passing and she's getting better every day. And we have her in passing drills and, but we can't expose her to say, we're putting you in a match with that responsibility, but there is an ability to learn it, but it takes time and it takes pressure and it takes a mentality to be a six rotation serve receiver. And if they haven't done it in college, how can they be expected to do it in their first year out of college? I don't think that can happen. Interesting. Hey, Sheldon, uh, one last question uh, real quick. I was with Doug Beal this weekend watching six collegiate men's matches, and he's, he said something that's really interesting. He said that the women's game um, tends to be a one outside hitter. One outside hitter can impact the winning tremendously while the, the men – rely on two outside hitters or in some some cases three outside hitters is that what you're saying by selecting an outside hitter as your first choice uh when i ask you that question are, are you thinking the same thing i don't know usually i get your questions mick i watch every week <laughs> and i listen carefully i guess what you're i mean what i'm thinking is if you're really rich then you got two outsides and an opposite and you're for your kind of rich you got one outside and one second outside and an okay opposite. And if you're poor, you got one outside hitter and no opposite and one bad outside hitter. 
I mean, what Doug's saying is if you if you have the riches of having two top left side hitters and one great opposite, everybody would love to have that. I mean, you could have that as a high school team if you have that relative to your opponent. So I'm not really sure. I know what you're asking. I, I, I don't know that comparing the men's and the women's game, I don't, I think what we're talking about is, is the riches that you have on your roster, not comparing men and women. No, he, he's talking about dominating players. Um, yeah. He's, he's talking about the most elite women. Uh, if they played our game, if all the elite women played our game, uh, possibly they could dominate a match. One of them could dominate a women's match. Uh, he didn't think that one male could dominate a men's match, right. maybe because of the height of the net. He wasn't trying to compare men and women. He was trying to compare the games Yeah, yeah. of, of how, how coaches are thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that on a sliding scale would be that I have seen some I've seen some male opposites go up there and you know the ball's finished before they swing and it's laughable. So there are some people that dominate, but I don't know. I think as our game is emerging, more and more female players are able to emerge into that role of being dominating and and um they're they're coming and I think they're exciting to watch. But I also think I think our game is moving at a level where there's a lot more back row attacking. The attacking from the back row is much faster than ever. I think before it was like an out of system play that wasn't that big of a deal. And now there's people running it when it's 23, 24 and you have to have a side out. Who is your most dominant row attack? Who is your most dominant outside hitter? Well, you know, we have an interesting thing. We have Betty De La Cruz who is a vet and we have Brooke Nunaviller. So we have this interesting combination of Betty De La Cruz with her deal and, and Brooke Nunaviller is the classic, you know, all around player. But I will tell you about Brooke Nunaviller. There was one time when she was like a, the classic left side hitter number two who could pass and not hit high numbers. Brooke Nunaviller is a, is a beast of an outside hitter right now. And she can hit with anybody in the league. And she did that at Athletes Unlimited where she was one of the legit top left sides in the league. And she's doing it here. She is a legitimate now. She's not just a shot maker, keep the ball in play, good passer. She is one of the highest kill percentage people that's going to be in the league. So we're excited about her evolution as a player from that to something even more. So I think the you know, tonight we're going to play and Lee Edmonds really good and and um, Ali Lenahan's really good. And, and a lot of times it is left to the outside hitters to decide matches and and if that happens tonight, I think it's going to be a pretty good show. Well, Sheldon, I, I'd like to thank you very much for taking time out of a very busy schedule to, to come and, and be with us and wish you the best of luck tonight in the match. I know you and Todd will be battling it out for, for a couple hours before that thing's going to be over. Yeah, and I just appreciate you guys. Like I said, I think, I think smart volleyball people tune into this to get insights and and um, under different things. And I always watch and I think it's interesting. So, you know, I just want to take some time to show my appreciation to you guys and your support of our league has been tremendous. And I just felt like it was good to come on with you guys and, and hear some of the things you're thinking and the challenging questions you have. I think it's great. So I'm just happy to be a part of this show sometimes and really happy to be part of this league that's going to take off and go tonight. And there's going to be a whole lot of people watching it. So it'll be fun. Good luck tonight, Shelton. Thanks. Yeah, thank you guys very much. All right, Shelton. Well, and to our listeners, thanks for tuning in to the Master Coaches Wednesday Weekly Buzz. Don't forget to subscribe, and we'll catch you next week with more coaching wisdom. And until then, keep coaching and keep winning.